Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here and to talk as uh, part of this uh, second meeting of the AI community in Bulgaria. Uh, I want to also thank our host for organizing this and making it possible. I think it's great that uh, you're doing this and uh, thank you for this. Uh, so my topic for today is uh, how to build a defensible business uh, in the age of AI. Uh, and here defensible, I mean like a, a business that's able to protect itself uh, from competition. So it's not about uh, national defense or, or self-defense or anything like that. Uh, it's more of a business topic. I hope it's interesting. Uh, by the way, how many entrepreneurs here tonight in the room? So yeah, okay. And people who want to build a startup maybe? Okay, so 50-50 I say, okay. Hopefully it's interesting. All right, uh, before we go into the topic, uh, just a quick introduction. So my name is Georgi, uh, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, my background is technical. I studied software engineering uh, here in Sofia. Then I worked as a developer, software engineer, team lead, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, and I always wanted to start a business, to start a company, but um, I didn't really knew why. And uh, I did start the company eight years ago together with my co-founder, uh, but at the time I still didn't uh, didn't know why I'm doing it. And uh, I was just doing software development. I knew how to do it, and I started a software development company. But I didn't think about uh, what problem I want to solve, who I want to be my customer. I didn't think uh, what business model I I want to have, uh, how the company will make money. I just knew how to do software development. Um, so we started this company uh, eight years ago, like I said, uh, and initially it was really exciting. It was very fun, like everything, uh, you, you know, when you start something new, you have high motivation. Uh, but then we had some, you know, ups and downs. Uh, then we had some more downs and uh, we also had some really difficult times. And uh, there were times that uh, we weren't sure if the company will even survive. So there were some difficult times. But eventually it got better and uh, eventually we started to understand the business and how things work and uh, we improved. And uh, at one point uh, we were managing uh, close to 80 people, including uh, like external partners. And we were started to, to do well also financially. Um, our people were happy to work in the company. We had great culture. Uh, our customers were happy. So things were going well but then we thought uh, okay what what do we do now um, because you see to to, to scale an, an outsourcing company or, or any service company the only way is to just hire more people just to add more people uh, and we didn't want to do that because uh, so one thing is because of the culture because with the scale you simply lose the culture and uh, like i said it was very important for us uh, and the other is we thought that may maybe outsourcing is actually not the business of the future. Maybe we want to be somewhere else. Uh, so we thought about it uh, and we decided that we will sell the company. So we looked for a buyer and eventually we found one uh, that was uh, a good fit for us. Uh, we went through all the, the whole process like with the negotiations, the due diligence, uh, then the actual acquisition. Uh, and uh, and eventually all went well. And it was quite a journey, I say, uh, but we had uh, like a happy ending. Is the question where we want to go next? Uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, you know, artificial intelligence and all the crazy progress of the last year. And I think there are tons of opportunities, like uh, really, really exciting times. But at the same time, we, we want to approach it a little bit smarter and think about the business model before starting the business and not uh, like a few years after. So because of this, we also think where we, we don't want to go. And uh, we don't want to build a business that uh, there's uh, like a ton of competition. So we want to build something that's uh, sustainable long term. Uh, but we want, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, so here's like, uh, yeah, it's uh, in the app store like a, and a chat with an AI. So the last one is chat GPT. This is, uh, of course, different, but all the others. So how do you make a choice if you're a user or, or if you're the business? How do you differentiate yourself with, from, from all the others? Uh, and to give you another example, 
uh, I think uh, all of you know about this uh, chat with PDF service. Uh, yeah, do, do you know it? So for the ones that not, just quickly, it allows you to basically ask the, ask the PDF uh, question. So you upload the document, you can, it, it's actually pretty cool. I think it's, it's, a, it's a cool service, a cool product, but at the same time, it's very easy to implement technically. So it's not really defensible. So it's a good product, but I think it's not a good business because one year ago, I, I looked the uh, search page of Google, so from one year back, and there was only one service that was doing this. Uh, and now, this is the Google search page if you just look for chat with PDF. So the first one is the original, but then we have like, uh, I, I think like 15 or 20 others that are basically copies because it's just so easy to implement. So again, I think this is, this is a good product, but it's not a good business. Uh, and I'll give you a third example, so why it's, uh, it's bad to have so, so many competition. Uh, so in 2019, so this is like from a different uh, field. In 2019, the revenue of the airline industry, so the uh, all commercial airlines worldwide combined, was 838 billion. And from this, they generated 26 billion of net profit. So it's like 3%. In the same year, Apple had 260 billion in revenue, but they had 65 billion of net profit. So this is more than double. And just think about it, this is just one tech company. In 2019, they have more than double the net profit of the entire industry. So you can, you can just imagine like every airplane in the world, every airport with like hundreds of people running around, all this generated less profit than one tech company. And uh, by the way, I picked 2019 because this is like pre-COVID because we, we want to rule that out. So the airplanes, I think this is a, a great product, right? It, I mean, it brings enormous value to the customer. So it's, it's really, really important. But at the same time, it's not a great business because of this competition and because it's not something that can, you, you, you can't differentiate between all the others because really when, when you buy a ticket, you want to get from A to B, you want to get a good price, maybe you want to get timings that are not too terrible, but you don't care what uh, sort of uh, salty or sweet snack you get or what brand is the coffee. So it's very hard to differentiate from all the others. And because of this, the only thing they compete on is price. And when you compete mostly on price, it brings down the prices until you have almost no profit because 3% 3, 3 is like the margin of error. Uh, and here's Peter Thiel with I think the perfect summary of this point is like creating value is not enough. You also need to capture some of the value you create. So as a business, you also want to capture the value. You may have a great product, but it doesn't mean that you have a great business. Right, so uh, how do we avoid this situation and uh, uh, what can we do to build a business that is also able to protect itself from competition? And uh, to do it, we need an economic mode. So this is like a metaphor, like a castle has a mode around the walls that protects it from attacks. In the same way, business has an economic mode. So this is like a long-term sustainable competitive advantage. Basically, this is something that would be difficult for others to recreate, to copy. So something that makes uh, the business uh, unique and able to, to protect itself from competition. Mm. So this is something that, uh, because we saw the other company and we're thinking what to do now. So this is something that I'm thinking a lot about lately. Uh, but I also don't have all the answers. So Today I'm just sharing with you my thoughts and it would be really interesting to talk to you about it and maybe uh, get some ideas. Uh, but a few ideas that I can share. Uh, so first, uh, I think a lot of things change now with artificial intelligence and a lot of things uh, are already changing and will change in the future. But also some things will remain the same. Uh, and maybe the, the things that used to work, the things that used to make a business a great business, maybe they won't change that much. So that's why I think uh, 
like the, the new modes are also the old modes. The things that used to work will continue to work in the in the future. So I, I'll quickly go through some of the main ones, uh, so like traditional competitive advantages. Uh, first, network effects. Uh, so this is a really important one. So you, you can think about any social network or any marketplace that uh, has two sites like uh, buyers and sellers or um, any any site that has user-generated content. So for example, you can think if uh, if I try to do a Airbnb competitor that has like better user experience, but there are no offerings, so nobody's going to this. So uh, this is something that's a, a very important uh, uh, competitive advantage and uh, for example also Google when they tried to build Google Plus I think you remember a few years back they failed even though it's uh, it's Google so uh, I didn't read the definition so when the value of a product increases as more people use it so basically uh, this sort of businesses the next one economies of scale uh, when the cost of production on a per unit basis declines as the company expands, basically any big company has enormous cost advantage. And for example, uh, if you think about Amazon, uh, they can offer a lot of products very cheaply and also offer very fast and very cheap delivery, which uh, all around the world, uh, which would be impossible for a, for a small company. So this is, uh, this is also a big advantage. The next one is very interesting. High switching costs. The marginal benefits of moving to a different provider are outweighed by the associated costs, which means basically that uh, if you try to, to move to another provider, uh, you also need to, for example, migrate your data or your process. Uh, I put AWS as, as an example because, for example, if you, if you have software and you're using AWS and you have some proprietary services that you're using, you also need to rewrite part of your application to move to a, to a different cloud provider. And I'm not doing it unless the benefits are substantial, right? I mean, I, I won't rewrite half the application just to save a few percentage points of the, of the cost. So um, in the same way, I think any business software can make this a, a big advantage uh, because one, one thing is the data, which is important. But the, another thing that is very important is that if you have all the people in the company that already onboarded on the software, there's enormous cost to make the people use a new software because it was hard enough for them to learn the old software. So if they need to move to a new one, it needs to be substantially better. There needs to be a big reason to do it. So I, I think this is uh, very important and it, it could be a big advantage for any business software that's already there. Uh, and the last one of those is uh, actually a bunch of uh, things bundled together in tangibles. So First, I put proprietary technology, which I think is a little bit tricky because on one hand, uh, I think it's difficult for a, for a startup to make technology a competitive advantage because if you're able to do something with like a few people for a few months, uh, probably another company will be able to replicate this with a similar amount of time or a company with more resources uh, even uh, for sure we will be able to the same time. In the same time, uh, also for Google, this clearly is a big advantage because um, they have retained their um, uh, their advantage in, in search for, for many years, even though, for example, Microsoft has enormous resources and has surely spent a lot on trying to make Bing uh, competitor to Google. They, they still can't do it, at least for now. Um, so yeah. Uh, Technology could be a big advantage, but uh, I think it's hard to, to execute. Uh, next one is brand. I think that's pretty clear. The, the classic example is the Coca-Cola company, but of course you can think of many others. Uh, and then we have patents and licenses, basically things that uh, will let you legally operate uh, or will, uh, for example, uh, if you have a patent on some drug, then nobody else can manufacture it for like 10 years. So, uh, this is pretty clear. And now, <clears throat> sorry, uh, these were like the traditional ones and uh, now to move uh, to the artificial intelligence topic and to the future, uh, something that I think is uh, already getting uh, very important and I think will be even more important in the future. This is uh, proprietary data. 
So I, I think this is going to, to be a competitive advantage that will be very important in the future uh, because there are now a lot of models that are open source and uh, of course anyone can use also the APIs of OpenAI and so on. And uh, there is even more open source technology coming uh, out every day. But if you have proprietary data and you're able to uh, you know, use it to improve your models and uh, if nobody else has this data set, then you can create a unique solution that is very hard to replicate even using existing technologies. Uh, so I, I think this could be a big advantage for a, for a startup company and uh, maybe thinking, okay, but if I'm a new company, then how do I get the data if, uh, if I don't have it? So a uh, few ideas. Uh, one is, I, I think it's very important to have a data strategy and to make this uh, a priority for the company. Uh, and I, I think, for example, if you're a startup, you can do two things. Uh, you can um, look for existing companies that maybe has this uh, data, but then don't have the technical know-how on how to uh, extract the value, how to use it. And uh, maybe you can build a partnership with a company like this, and this could be a win-win. Uh, and another thing is uh, maybe you can use your customer's data. Uh, so I read, a company, uh, read about a company that did this and uh, you can just offer discounts or even the product for free to your first customers, but in exchange that you're able to use their data to train your models and ideally get that exclusively so only you are able to use the data. You collect the data, you aggregate from all the different customers and after some time, you have a data set that's unique, and that is, is very important. And uh, you only you have this data set because all the customers, they only have the parts, but you have the whole thing and you're able to use it. And I think this could be a big advantage uh, and could be very important in the future. I think this is like close to the, the end. So uh, I want to just go back to the example of Apple and what makes Apple a great company. Uh, so I think in order to build a great company, you need more than one. You, you can't just have one on the list. I think you need more. And in the case of Apple, uh, and what, what makes it uh, so much more efficient, like the, more efficient than the whole airline industry is, uh, they have a very strong brand. So that's clear, I think. Uh, it's one of the strongest in the world. They have proprietary technology, both in software and hardware. They have economies of scale because they're so big, they manufacture very cheaply and uh, they sure you can control the prices on the materials they use. So they have that. They're also benefiting from uh, network effects because the, the App Store is a marketplace. After all, so uh, if you want to compete with that, you need to bring both the developers and the users. And uh, for example, Microsoft uh, were not successful with uh, the Windows Phone back, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, so it is, uh, it is important and uh, I think you also have the high switching cost because I'm an Apple user for example and if I, if I want to move to another platform I will have to think about migrating my data but uh, I also need to uh, maybe think about the apps I'm using, maybe they won't work, maybe I need to buy a new one so this creates some friction so I think they, they have a combination of many things. For, for sure, they have also uh, using the proprietary data from the users, I think. So, yeah. Uh, so, I think they're checking all the boxes on the list, and I uh, think this is really important. So, uh, final recap uh, of the whole talk. This was it. Uh, hope it was interesting. Uh, so, we talked about competition. We talked how com why competition is bad for business. Uh, and we talked about what you can do about it. We talked some, about some of the traditional uh, competitive advantages. We talked about proprietary data as a possible new competitive advantage. Uh, and we talked uh, how if you want to build a great company, you need to have more than one and ideally many. And with this, I say thank you very much for your attention. It was a real pleasure uh, and please do get in touch. This is uh, like an old QR code because uh, yeah, I haven't seen your representation. Next time I'll bring a fancy one. But yeah, please do get in touch. We'd be very happy to 
to talk with you about anything related to artificial intelligence, business, investing, startups, anything like that. It would be great. Thank you so much.